Well, Dr. Wilton, thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of Lynch with a Leader. It is an honor to have you. It's a wonderful privilege to be with you, Mike. Thank you for having me, brother. Well, this is this is going to be fun. I remember years ago hearing you. I was a student, was a master's student in New Orleans here at, having your class, and it was so much fun. Now, what I did know, and I've heard you share a little bit about this, you, of course, didn't grow up in South Carolina. I think we all picked that up from your accent. <laughs> Tell everybody a little bit of your background and how you came to know Christ. Well, Mike, I, you know, you're right. Everybody talks about my Southern accent, you know. <laughs> You'd think after 44 years that I'd learned how to talk properly, you know. But uh, no, I was born uh, in South Africa, actually in Zululand on the Upper East Coast and grew up in a wonderful family, very adventurous life. <laughs> you know, I never saw television set until I was 20 years old, you know, and I mean, just absolutely unbelievable. And, uh, but, you know, I, I finally, you know, got out of, uh, you know, high school and everybody in the land in which I live, much like Vietnam, um, uh, we were, we all had to go off to military service and I became a tank commander, was sent off into Southwest Africa uh, in the desert and then the, the Angolan Civil War, um, then came home to Civvy Street in this is in the early 19 end of the 60s 70s so i'm aging myself yeah and uh uh you know went to church the first day on civvy street and, and saw this most beautiful girl who's been my wife now for the past 45 years wow. you know she mike had an incredible uh influence not only did i fall in love with her physically so to speak but uh she just loved the lord and uh she had such an influence in my life and my life. I, I had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, brother, as a young man in my early 20s. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of studies and all that kind of stuff. And uh, very shortly thereafter, God called both of us into the gospel mm. ministry. And we were being visited by a, a gentleman from Mississippi uh, by the name of Dr. J. Roy McComb. I could hardly understand him, you know. <laughs> And uh, let alone fell Mississippi. And, uh, you know, he walked up to me because someone told him, he said, man, young man, you need to come to America. You know, we have mm. seminaries you can do and earn PhD and all that really got my attention. Uh, and long story short, brother, we sold up everything. And uh, in the early 70s, we came over to the United States, had no intention of staying in America. Uh, and I, I went to the beautiful New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I had no idea I'd become a member of the faculty there and have such a love affair. <laughs> had That's no amazing. idea that my, my middle son has just been named Dean of Level Chapel. Has Level he Chapel. really? Oh, that's awesome. My son, Dr. Greg Wilton, has just been named. He's beginning his ministry there. And he was born and raised on that campus, as That's was my fantastic. oldest son, Rob, who preaches all over the country, and my daughter, who uh, loves the Lord and lives overseas, been serving with some persons in South Sudan and so on and so forth. So God, you know, God is a great God, Mike, isn't he? And isn't what he's he? looking for is a surrendered life. Mm. And when you surrender your life, he takes you and he gives to you that leadership capacity to make an impact on everyone else you meet. And that's all I thank the Lord for is the opportunity to share Christ and to have an impact on other people's lives. That is real leadership. And that's what motivates me so much. You know, when, when that happened, you moved to the States, you surrender your life to the Lord. How did you feel like, because we're looking back now in the rearview mirror, we're not out the front windshield, we're looking back in the rearview mirror of your life. How did you think at that time the Lord was going to use you? What did you think? I mean, you're you're looking at yourself. You're a tank commander. You're coming from South Africa. You have no background in religious stuff. How did you think at that time the Lord would use you? Mike, in all honesty, I had no idea mm. uh, because I did not have the privilege of seeing tomorrow. But I do think looking in the rear view mirror, that both my wife and I understood the meaning of surrender. Mm. 
Now, I know that sounds somewhat braggadocious, if I might say so. It sounds like I'm feathering my own. But you, you're you saying to me, yep. look, I'm looking back, okay, yep. over 45 years now. And I can tell you that I do know that the deepest intent of my heart and my wife, Karen, was to just simply be available to mm. the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot follow Christ and not be totally sold out to him what part of surrender involves holding back that's right what part of fellowship means you serve your own interest now that's relative we love i love everything man i love football i love uh, fishing man i used to love going down those bayous in louisiana and catching redfish and i still do and i love good food you know and and i love my kids and my grandkids but that does not take away from the fact that Jesus said, you want to follow me, give it up, mm. forsake all and follow me. And the Bible even says, you've got to go to the point at which you are willing to walk away from your family, from your parents, from the things that you hold in your heart. Here's the irony, Mike. You walk away from that toward Christ and he gives you back more than you had to begin with. That's right. Because he fulfills the desires of your heart. But many of us today belong to the one foot club. Hmm. We've got men everywhere who have got one foot in God's kingdom and they keep one foot in the world and they wonder why they've got split personalities and they never experience the fullness of God by his spirit. It's because they are not sold out. Get hmm. your foot out of the world put it into the world of Jesus Christ and God will give you the world mm. Mm. because it's his world. That's right. That's so he good. Multiplies our blessings. And if people would just be surrendered. So now we're looking in the rear view mirror here and I'm saying to myself, yes, I do think that Karen and I, even in our total understand misunderstanding or ignorance, we came to America with two suitcases in our hands, $1,400 in, in our pockets. We landed in New York City with nowhere to go. We knew nobody. And we said, here I am, Lord, use mm, me. Mm. We never said we'd stay in America. I never said I'd go to New Zealand. Or to England, jolly right, I wanted to go to England because I wanted to play cricket and I wanted to at least drive on the right side of the road and be able to eat chips instead <laughs> the French fries and, and be able to drink jolly good cups of tea. You know, of course I wanted that. I was British in my background, but goodness me, I wouldn't trade being in the United States, my children, the heritage, this beautiful nation from sea to shining sea today, as I look back in the rear view mirror, how did this happen? Surrender yourself right. to the Lord Jesus. Mm. And, and that surrender, I love that theme because that surrender got you from what you thought you were going to do, staying in New Orleans to First Baptist Church, Spartanburg, South Carolina. I mean, you leave beautiful, the beautiful confines of Cajun country to go to South Carolina where they also don't always understand somebody from South Africa, but God gets you there. And in that move, you preach your very first sermon at a church, First Baptist Church, Spartanburg, South Carolina, and received a phone call that really in a lot of ways changed not the course of your life, but definitely changed a piece of your life. Tell everybody a little bit about the phone call that you got in the pastor study after your message there. I will, I will never forget it. Uh, Mike, I, we, we, our church was on regional television. Walked back to my study on that first day, uh, very first day, and uh, my phone rang. And the voice on the other side said, uh, this is Billy Graham here. And uh, if you'll beg my pardon, I can't remember all the things, but it was, you know, yes, you know, and I'm the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, all the other things came to mind, but something deep in my heart said to me, you know, this voice certainly <laughs> sounds like Billy Graham, you know, and I, I, uh, it was, it was Dr. Graham and Mrs. Graham. They were calling ostensibly to welcome me 
to the pulpit. They'd watched the service on television. And we had the most incredible conversation. And at the end of the conversation, he said to me, I was just wondering whether you could possibly find time to come up and visit us at our home in Montreat. <laughs> well, tongue in cheek, it's amazing how I changed my entire schedule, you know. <laughs> All of a sudden, uh, nothing else seemed to be quite as it important. freed up. I don't know what happened. Everything I just was, freed up. I became freed up. You know, everybody knew how busy and how important I was. You That's know? right. That's right. Well, the next day, I drove up to Montreat to the office, and I was taken up in this these black limos and cars with antennas on. And oh man, Mike, I I will spend the rest of my life trying to figure out how for the next twenty five years. Mm. Uh, I was able to sit at the feet of this most amazing man of God mm. and why God would ever have allowed me that privilege. I'll spend the rest of my life thanking Jesus for that, Mike. I, I've never, I learned so much sitting at the feet. I, I learned from this man what it means to be a real leader for Christ. Mm. That's what I learned. And, you know, when I wrote Saturdays with Billy after his death, you know, Mike, you're going to find me stumbling around. Now I'm a man sometimes of too many words, but when it comes to some of the things that God has done for me, what can you say? Mm -hmm. And uh, it just flowed out of my heart, brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had had the privilege for all those years of, traveling up there and being with him and being surrounded by some of the most famous people in the world from athletes to politicians. And, you know, Mr. Graham's life of prime ministers and presidents and Kings and Queens and to watch this man lead like Jesus mm, mm. Uh, in a very real way. And added to that, Mike, my relationship as his personal friend, and then as his pastor, I was with him privately privately mm. for the majority of the time and our conversations ran deep uh this this was not uh, nine times out of ten there were no crowds there brother mike this was not in a stadium uh this was not uh if you'll beg my pardon there was nobody out there to impress or mm. to mm. Uh, incline towards one ear or one's ear or to one's understanding god gave me uh, the opportunity to be able to be invited into the heartbeat, mm. the inside of, of a man that had been used so mightily of the Lord across the world. Mm. And that's what Saturdays with Billy really is all about. It's not a biography, as you know, that's right. many biographies, wonderful biographies. You can Google Dr. Billy Graham anywhere in the world. I've just got back from England preaching for the Billy Graham Association over there last week, uh, met hundreds, thousands of people, everybody. They come from every walk of life. Uh, you can find anything you want to about Billy Graham. But this book, Saturdays with Billy, is about the man. Mm. It's about the leader. It's about this man who made such an indelible mark on the hearts of countless numbers of people from the least of them right. to the greatest of them because his leadership leading like Jesus enabled Billy Graham to touch people regardless of who they were or where they came from or the color of their skin or their nationality or their culture. He led like Jesus because Jesus was the one to whom Billy Graham owed everything he was a debtor to christ mm -hmm. his savior and lord mm -hmm. and i have so much that i can talk about in that regard as you know what changed the most you I mean you so you arrive at first baptist spartanburg you are you're a national speaker at this time you've traveled the country you have been in new orleans trained hundreds of students thousands of students you're known here you show up as a new pastor. He he listens. He and Miss Ruth listen. What changed the most about you as a Christ follower, 
as a leader, as a husband, as a dad from your time with Dr. Graham? How did that time shape that part of you during those years? That's such a, a deeply penetrating question, Mike. May I suggest to you, and I think that that those who have grown to love me or to have been around me, I've been in my church for 29 years, mm. and uh, they would be a better judge of that. Mm. But may I suggest to honor your question, my sitting with Dr. Billy Graham gave me a God-given opportunity to see myself in a fresh way. Mm. It was like looking into a mirror in which was Dr. Billy Graham. But it was when I sat with him and walked with him and talked with him, prepared sermons with him, wrote books with him, uh, went to places with him, ate countless wonderful meals with him, laughed our heads off together with him, played with the dogs with him, putted golf balls down the passageway with him, interacted with him. God began to give me a picture of myself. And spiritual leaders cause that. Mm -hmm. I think the essential mark of spiritual leadership is not the leader himself. It is rather those that are looking at the spiritual leader. That's the mark of spiritual leaders. Mm. So as I grew in my relationship, my love for and my interaction uh, with Dr. Billy Graham, God caused me and allowed me by his grace to persistently look into my own heart mm, mm. from God's perspective, because I was looking at God's servant. So I would see this leadership, which was so unequivocal and so powerful in this man. And I would begin to see that in the light of my own life. So in direct answer to your question, <laughs> which is difficult for me to say, I think one of those things that God began to deal with me was my own pride. Mm. Because there was no pride in mm. Mr. Graham. Now, Mike, just if, if I may, brother, please interrupt me. This, this doesn't make sense. Because here's a man that is listed in the, in the top five of who's who in the world for 60 consecutive years. This is a man that presidents come to him. He doesn't go to them. This is a man that the Queen of England calls his home to chat with him. This is a man that is visited by people that you and I would correctly regard in a very, the athletes. I mean, you mm. talk about famous athletes, golfers, baseball players, Mike. Uh, these guys that you and I would beat the bushes down and then some to try and even get close to, to get an autograph from them. Mm. Mm. They would come to see Mr. Graham and they would line up and wait to get in the door. But he was so humble. There was no pride in him. There was nothing in Mr. Graham that said, look at me. Mm, mm. Well, I would meet with Mr. Graham and I would see him and listen to him and interact with him and have the opportunity on occasion to see him with these other people. But I would see him interacting with the man who came to collect the garbage from the house and the man who cut the lawn and the window cleaner, as well as the prime ministers and the presidents. And Mr. Graham was so humble. Mm. If, if I may say, Mike, and if you would beg my pardon for a moment, brother, and if I may say to, to our listening audience today, if you were to ask, what is the picture 
of Don Wilton and Billy Graham sitting together, having a cup of tea or eating ribs together. What, what does that picture look like? Here's the picture. I want you to really get a hold of this. That picture of Don Wilton, Dr. Billy Graham. Here's the picture. It's a picture of a nobody mm. who really thought he was a somebody talking to a somebody who really thought he was a nobody. Mm. Mm. Everything was backwards. Now I'm going to tell you something and, and, and you, and our listeners today can laugh their heads off, get ready to fall off your chair. And if you, if you're listening right now, don't, don't, don't end it. Listen, you ready for this? If you'd be in a fly on the wall at any time over these almost 25 years, whether we were in the bedroom, the study, the kitchen, walking, restaurant, wherever it was, you were a fly on the wall. I promise you, you would have thought I was the most important person in the room. Mm. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Is that not the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard in your life? Most people, that, I mean, we'd have people come up there and Mr. Graham would say, meet my pastor, Don. They'd say, Don who? <laughs> who? 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 Don what? Wilton what? Where, where do you come from? You know? Uh, you know, and then, of course, I'd always tell them I'm from Louisiana. And some of them, especially from the northern states, they'd say, oh, I thought you sounded like a Cajun. You know? I mean, these guys had no, had no idea. You know? I, you would have thought the way Mr. Graham talked to me, Mike, and treated me and honored me, you would have thought I was the important person. Now, have you ever heard anything more utterly preposterous in your entire life? Mm. But I'm going to tell you that it's true. You know, you said something in the book I thought was so interesting, and I think it's the mark of a great leader who doesn't think of themselves like a leader. You said, he asked me so many questions. He always was asking me questions. And I remember years ago on this podcast, I was interviewing a gentleman, and he said, everybody in life has two choices. We can be interested or we want to be interesting. Yes. And Dr. Graham was truly interested in you what did it tell you about his heart that he was so interested in whoever he was with because I have a feeling whoever sat in that chair next probably said the exact same thing about him what was it in him that caused that inquisitiveness and for you and, and it even goes back to one of your other statements when you called him Dr. Graham and he said just call me Billy yeah yeah yeah, what absolutely. was it about him that caused that, you think? First of all, to the day he died, he never considered himself any more than a sinner saved mm -hmm. by the grace of God. Now, Mike, that is, is, is so profound. Mm -hmm. in, in our Christian world today, the spiritual elitism, is destroying the fabric Amen. of the evangelical church. We've got so, uh, please don't hear this as a criticism, but we've got so many Christian brothers who are so important that they, they, they cannot help but strut around exuding their importance. Mr. <laughs> please allow me to say, if anybody had a right from my <laughs> point of view to do a little strutting. That's so good. That's so you're spot on. You I, are so I, 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 there were many times he'd, he'd, he'd be mortified because he said something or so, and he'd look at me and he'd say, Oh, Don, I, I really didn't mean to come across like that. And I, I'd say to him, I'm telling you, I'd say to him, brother Billy, it's okay. You can strut a little bit, you know, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm trying to say? It's oh. like, please, please have, a, have a go, have a great strut. You know, Mr. Graham saw himself first and foremost as a sinner saved by the grace of God. You know, just as an aside, and I, and I think I mentioned this in Saturdays with Billy. 
um, posted in his home in, in a number of strategic places was Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Yep. Um, and, you know, even when I preached his funeral service, I, that's the text I used because it was so profound to him. I'm not going to boast in any other other than Jesus. Well, what does that mean? This was his modus operandus. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. I, I remember one time we're sitting there doing something, preparing a speech he had to make up in Washington or something like that. And we got onto this passage and I said, I, you know, I said, let's talk about this. And he said, he said, what about, what about being dead suggests any semblance of life? So I said, Mr. Graham, what do you mean by that? He said, well, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. He said, how do you become crucified and yet continue to be alive at the same time? Accepting in Christ. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. So here's that delicate balance. Now, don't I don't want our listeners to get the wrong impression here. This is not presenting you the picture of some soppy, um, wobbly piece of jello who who just lies there and wobbles around whichever direction the wind is blowing we all know that was not dr graham mm. his spiritual leadership was the strongest thing i've ever seen his words were action power packed listen he was quote unquote president and ceo of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, of which I'm a member of the board of directors today. Listen, Dr. Graham led one of the largest organizations in the world. And if you don't think he led it, he did. But he led it like Jesus. Mm. There's a difference between a self-projecting, mm. prideful leadership and a humble, Christ-like leadership the operative word in both cases is leadership that's right god never calls us to be leaders and to lie down and let everybody walk around and slap us around a little bit some of us need to stand up and be counted for righteousness mm -hmm. but we need to do it as dr graham taught me with a spirit of christ-likeness mm. and mr graham by the spirit of God, believed that he was a sinner. He never lost sight of his own unworthiness. <laughs> but he yet, but he lived in that tension of his unworthiness, but accepted in God's grace. Correct. In that spiritual tension he lived with, most people can never, they're either one or the other. They cannot yeah. find that. It's a it's such a unique thing to find. So in that, in that, he taught me about this thing called the daily walk. Mm. And 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 he he showed me uh, an, an area you were asking me about my own life. And I said in the area of pride and, and humility, and 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 in the area of, of your one's own personal self-discipline. Mm. Mr. Graham was personally self-disciplined. I came to understand how personally undisciplined I was. Amen. Now, this is an interesting subject, Mike, on a leadership, because, because to say that I'm not a disciplined person is not exactly right, because all of us have hallmarks of our discipline, mm. brother. That, that's not, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but a spiritual discipline carries with it a perpetual willingness to be submissive to the commandments of the Lord Jesus. In fact, you know, 1 John uh, chapter 2 tells us that you know that you know you're in Christ if you are willing to be obedient to his commands. That's a hallmark of our Christian discipleship. Mr. Graham lived that out and it was a passion within him not only to be perpetually reminded as to the deep meaning of his endowed grace which means that the grace of god 
covered him. What's mm. God's grace that he was undeserving mm. of anything. And yet he was the full recipient of everything. That's right. He was undeserving of anything, but at the same time, he was the full recipient of everything that mm. God gave to him. There's a fresh, I'm not preaching here, I'm trying not to, but there's a great definition of the imputed righteousness of Christ. It's what Christ does for me and in me. Right. I'm alive in, in Christ. And Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham walked with Jesus. Now, Mike, even, even in the book there, without violating the sanctity of our, our relationship, I could have written another 10 books on, on our relationship. And, uh, but I even got a little section there on, on Mr. Graham's regrets talking yeah. about him. I was with Mr. Graham was a grandfather, great grandfather, a husband who loved Miss Ruth with all of his heart. Boy, did he love his children, Franklin and, and Anne and Gigi and Ned and, and, and Ruth. I mean, just with a passion, uh, we prayed together. I, I had the privilege of praying for his now grown uh, sons and daughters, for their spouses, for, mm. for his grandchildren, man, to hear him praying for Edward and for Will and, and, and for all the grandkids. And we would do this repeatedly. But into all of this, he was traveler. He had a body. Uh, that was subject to the aches and pains. Mm. Listen, wearisomeness, exhaustion. He was gone from home for months on end. He was subject to, uh, to, to, to fatigue uh, at the highest levels possible. Mike, he, 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 was, uh, he was criticized, brother. Listen, you cannot serve the Lord as a servant of the Lord Jesus and proclaim Jesus and not expect to be criticized. Mm. Listen, the world is going to come after you. You be a spiritual leader, get ready. Put on the armor of God. Uh, Paul told the church at Ephesus, leaders, put on the armor of God so that when the devil comes, not if the devil comes, he is going to nail your hind leg to the floorboard. And I'll tell you that old devil tried to do everything he could to get Mr. Graham from every angle you could imagine. So mm. my relationship with him was talking about, talking through, dealing with discouragement, dealing with the aches and pains, dealing with the things that he felt uh, were not measuring mm. up to what he felt this, but he dealt with it in such a real personal way that I saw the triumphant rising up of the power of the spirit of God within this incredible man that translated this into the beauty of the wholeness and the fullness of a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, in so much of it, it, the book is phenomenal. And I hope everybody listening will go and get this book. It is so good. I know I downloaded the Kindle version. You've got it on uh, you've got it on audio book. You can download the hard copy. You can order the hard copy. So, so good. And there are, I mean, there's stories in there about Winston Churchill. There's stories in there. There is just full of great, great stories. Yeah. Two things as we wrap up today. One, that spoke so much out of that funeral service was the casket he was in mm. this, mm. this, this is unbelievable. Who made Dr. Wilton, who made the casket? This three, three condemned felons at Angola state penitentiary in Louisiana made the casket into which we placed the body of Dr. Billy Graham. Mm. And the message of that was so powerful. Mm. And you know, Mike, and I'll tell you this very briefly, just moments before the president of the United States and the first lady and the vice president and the second lady walked in to speak to the family just moments before the funeral. I walked over, and there's a picture, by the way, in Saturdays with Billy. We put that in there, the Billy Graham Association. We put that in the book. And I walked over, and I stood at that very casket. And I had a private conversation with dear brother Billy. 
I, I wish I could tell you my conversation, tears rolling down my mm. cheeks. Mm. And as I spoke to him, just moments before going out where millions of people would be listening from around the world, and just before, as the president, he was coming into the room, all of a sudden, the sun hit the cross at the library, the beautiful Billy Graham Library in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that sun sent a blazing, emblazoned cross from my back. And you can see it in the picture. And it came over. It's like it leapt over the top of my head. And the sun touched the top end of the casket and ran the length of the casket like it it didn't touch me. It went over me. My shadow should have been over the top of the casket, mm. but it didn't do it. I believe God sent the sun, the physical sun, and it blazed over and it spread over. And when it did that, I said, I said, Lord Jesus, thank you for Dr. Billy Graham for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. This man who boasted in none other than the cross of Christ Jesus. And it was as though, Mike, to me, to me, it was as though God was smiling down from heaven saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And I began to back off and I turned around and walked over and shook the hand of the president of the United States of America. And we then went out in the procession. And when we walked out, it was cold that day when we walked out into that huge tent on those grounds, I had this blazing warmth in my heart that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world and that by his grace and his mercy, he raised up this man Billy Graham to become a leader among men and that his life and testimony about Jesus would never die. Mm. It would live on forever because Jesus is alive.